Eleanor Brent was the young daughter of Julius and Amelia Brent, who had immigrated from Germany to the United States. She was born on the 22nd of April 1901 and was raised alongside her seven siblings in Sioux City, located in Iowa. At the age of just 15, Ella, as she was more commonly known, married Leroy Jarman in Lincoln, Nebraska, and together they had two sons, Leroy Jr. and Laverne. Ella was a determined and outspoken woman who worked as a waitress in a cafe and as a laundry woman. In 1930, during the dark days of the Great Depression, she was deserted by her husband, Leroy, and she subsequently moved from Sioux City to Chicago, Illinois. Juggling several jobs, she managed to keep her family afloat, and it was through her various jobs she met George Dale, a man who was six years her senior. He went on to become her lover, but also her partner in crime. George offered financial support for Ella and her sons, however it was later revealed that the money was acquired from robberies that George participated in. In the mid-1930s, Eleanor became known as the most dangerous female outlaw alive, having participated in over 60 hold-ups, 37 of which were carried out in a single summer. However, she was never convicted of these particular crimes. On the 4th of August 1933, elderly haberdasher Gustav Hua was going about his day as usual. For decades, he had dedicated his life to his shop in Chicago's North Side. Two men and one woman entered his establishment. The woman gave him a warm, kind smile and turned to examine some neckties. However, Gustav felt uneased by the sharp looks the two men gave him. One of the men requested a blue broadcloth shirt, with Gustav rummaging through various boxes on shelves to find the product. Distracted, the female opened her handbag with one of the men placing his hand inside and pulling out a gun. Startled, Gustav saw the woman then holding a blackjack saw in her hands. The second male darted towards the cash register. Gustav tried to defend himself as best he could. However, the woman swung the saw and hit the man on the skull, resulting in Gustav collapsing to the floor. He released a blood-curdling scream, which caused one of the men to misfire his weapon. In a storm of fury and panic, the trio fled the scene, fearful that the commotion would have been heard by neighbours. With all of his strength, Gustav crawled across the floor and grabbed the woman's skirt as she tried to leave the premises. Once again, she hit the man on the head, leaving him for dead. Miraculously, Gustav was clinging on to life. He managed to get the attention of passers-by and called for help. The woman yelled that the man was grabbing onto her and refused to let go. One of the men turned the pistol on Gustav and pulled the trigger four times, leaving Hua on the pavement, bleeding to death. Witnesses stated the men ran from the scene, but the woman lingered for a moment. She then viciously kicked the dying man. A man named John Brabeck, who drove by the scene of the murder, who at the time was unaware of such an incident, took note of the blue sedan, which became the murderous trio's getaway vehicle. The police and media dubbed the trio the Blonde Tigress and the Two Jackals. The car was identified by the help of witnesses, many of whom recalled the license plate, as belonging to an Errol Minecci, but had currently been in the possession of his brother Leo. After he saw a wanted poster in the local newspaper, Leo became incredibly distressed. He handed himself into the police station and told officers that he was present at the murder of haberdashery owner Gustav Hua. 
Leo explained that he was in the shop with a couple named Mr and Mrs Kennedy and they were searching for a specific blue clothing item. The alleged husband and wife fell into an argument which resulted in one of them pulling out a gun. The shopkeeper intervened, attempting to grab the gun, but in the chaos, Leo grabbed it and accidentally shot Gustav. Police did not believe Minecci's story, and they had several witness statements which contradicted his claims. However, they encouraged him to cooperate in order to find Mr and Mrs Kennedy. Police scrambled to 4300 West Madison Street, the known home of the Kennedys. Unfortunately, by the time authorities arrived, the couple, who were later identified as George Dale and Eleanor Berent Jarman, had scarpered along with Eleanor's two sons. Neighbours reported that the couple would often hold wild parties and were allegedly cruel towards Ella's children. A local druggist spoke of an incident when Eleanor spoke in a patronising tone with him as she hunted out blonde dye for her brunette hair. Shortly after initial investigations, a taxi driver confirmed that he took the so-called Kennedys from their residence to 6232 Drexel Avenue on the night of the murder. Police forced their way into the couple's second floor apartment, where Ella sported red hair. They easily surrendered and recovered beneath their pillows were four pistols and the blackjack saw. Eleanor had been running a beer flat. In other words, she was distributing alcohol illegally during the era of prohibition. She began participating in robberies once the beer business began losing profit due to the relaxation of prohibition. At trial in September 1933, they insisted that 71-year-old Gustav Hua's death was an accident. However, the evidence strongly suggested murder. Eleanor, who was compared to Bonnie of the infamous Depression-era criminal couple Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow, spoke of her early struggles in life, having married young and been abandoned by her husband, leaving her a single mother with no money. The jury, however, held no sympathy. Eleanor, George and Leo were all found guilty of murder. George Dale, the main perpetrator who shot the victim, was sentenced to death and, after writing a final love letter to Eleanor, was executed at Cook County Jail by electric chair on the 20th of April 1934. Leo Minecci was sent to Joliet Correctional Centre and Eleanor Berent Jarman was incarcerated at Illinois Penitentiary for Women at Dwight. The pair were sentenced to 199 years in prison, with Ella not being eligible for parole until she was 95 years old. Eleanor's children were taken into the care of her older sister, Hattie, and her husband, Joe. Despite the media stating that the blonde tigress had taken a last bite and had bitten off more than she could chew, Eleanor proved in 1940 that she was not yet finished with her life of crime. Noted as a model prisoner, Eleanor spent seven years without causing any trouble. Rumours reached Ella, who learned that her sons were planning on running away from their lives in Iowa. Eager to check on her children, Eleanor plotted to do the impossible and escape from prison. Eleanor had become friends with a fellow inmate, 39-year-old Mary Foster, a mother of four who had been given a 1-10 to year sentence for larceny in Chicago in January of 1939. Her criminal record revealed that in 1936, whilst travelling to the Federal Women's Prison in Alderson, West Virginia, Mary jumped from the train to a short period of freedom and she had escaped from a Cincinnati workhouse in 1938. The 8th of August 1940 started as normal for all of the prisoners at the Dwight Penitentiary. A warden confirmed that Mary and Eleanor completed regular housework duties at approximately 11am. One hour later, the pair failed to appear at lunch, resulting in a thorough search of the prison buildings and surrounding grounds, yet no trace of the women were found, although it appeared that a staff member's polka dot dresses were missing. 
Superintendent Helen Hazard could not explain the method by which the women used to escape from the penitentiary. However, it is assumed that Jarman and Foster climbed over a 12-foot fence topped with barbed wire. Their prison uniforms were later recovered in a field less than a mile from the penitentiary, and a taxi driver stated that he had dropped the women off in the centre of Morris, Grundy County, Illinois. The authorities failed, however, to capture the fugitives. Rumours circulated saying that Eleanor had travelled back to Sioux City, Iowa. She checked on her sons and departed from Iowa, laying low and heading underground. For the next 35 years, Eleanor kept away from her family. However, she created an intelligent form of communication with them. According to Doug Jarman, Eleanor's grandson, his father and grandmother would communicate through classified ads in various newspapers, such as the Kansas City Star. She informed her family through secret messages that she had never remarried after her escape and that she was employed at a restaurant. Simple phrases or codes were placed in the ads, such as let's have coffee, which according to Doug Jarman, meant something to him and the family. Doug pleaded for his grandmother to contact the family in 1993 as her grandchildren and great-grandchildren wanted to meet her, and also Eleanor's brother Otto Berent's health was failing. Otto's wife, Dorothy, was one of the last people to see Eleanor alive. In 1975, she made a swift visit to a Sioux City bus station and met with her sister-in-law. They joined Otto in his car and they drove to Isaac Walton Lake, where they talked for a while, with Ella asking if her boys, as she called them, were well. A police car patrolled the area, however, it soon departed. Otto and Dorothy were tense, however, Eleanor allegedly stated, Relax, the police stopped looking for me years ago. Later that evening, she had dinner with her son, Leroy, where he pleaded with her to come home and sort out the situation, but she refused. She reassured him that she has loyal friends who know the truth. Her family accompanied her back to Sioux City and watched her walking towards Greyhound bus station. This was the last time they ever saw her. It is assumed that when she died, as it is very unlikely that she is still alive, she was buried under an alias, although she is still listed officially as a fugitive. Eleanor Berent Jarman's life in the years following her escape and after her last meeting with her family remains a mystery. Mm -hmm.